Oh, because you had your hand up first. So what was oh, your question? Yeah, it's good. Oh, um, are we going to continue chapter 28? With, um... So I didn't get time to get to it yet. And I don't think we're going to have any questions on it on the final. So I'm going to let it go for now. Only reason being is it's just a specific scenario of logs, a special case of logs that you're going to learn in your junior year in pre-calc. So knowing the theory behind it is more than enough to learn. And then in pre-calc, you'll talk about what happens when the base of the exponent is the letter E. It's a specific number like pi. That's the only real major difference that you'll talk about. I may want to get to it later this week, but I don't think so just because we only have four days together, right? Monday through Thursday. So I'd rather review for the final. And we're not going to include problems from 10-8 on the final exam. So for that reason, I think I'm going to let it go for now. Okay? Uh, but if you wanted to look it up, it's called the natural logarithm or the natural base. That's what that's called, the letter E. And that's pretty much what chapter 10, section 8 is about. Okay? And you can read about it in the text if you want as well. Um, all right. Good question. But let's continue. <laughs> Anything you want to start with that specifically you want to go over for the, for the project itself? Yeah. On the project, will mm -hmm. there be a page like, on the projects, like on the midterm, and it will be the Excel thing? Will there be one in the final? So my thought for the final, so your third, your third quarter project was which one for you guys? Excel, I think. It was Excel with resource planning, MRP, right? So there'll probably be a question about that on the actual thing where I might give you a parent part and talk to you about filling out the secondary table from that. Um, and then the fourth quarter project is undefined by default, because everything on quadratics is undefined. So the fourth quarter project is definitely on it, but it's automatically on it. You can cover that material with math in section 75, 76, 77, you know? So that is guaranteed. Uh, and I'll probably give you one question, right, at the end of one of the MRT problems. And it can be something as simple as reading a table and understanding what the next uh, the child part should be ordered, or when it should be ordered, or how many you'll have left in surplus, or figuring out the cost of it. But if you could run through your project again and understand what you did, which you should understand at this point, if you did well, if you actually did it, then you'll be fine for that part of the project, you know? It's not going to be something that's going to be like, redo the entire thing. It would be like one table at most. Questions on this fourth quarter project that you struggled with? Anything on the fourth quarter project that you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, so the last like, section about intercept form is a little confusing. What I was asking. Okay. So in intercept form, some of you wrote down your function. And let's say that the function you had listed was x minus 4, x minus 60. Okay. Hypothetically, let's say your intercepts were 4 and 60. 4 centimeters from the starting point, and then 60 centimeters which means that your projectile went a total of 56 centimeters, right? From 4 to 60 is 56 centimeters. Now, earlier on in the project, you calculated values for A, B, and C using a matrix and using three points. And those values were most likely some decimals. They probably had decimals to them at some point. So you had Y equals AX squared plus BX plus C. And that was from earlier on in the project. So at the end, at the very end of this project, what I wanted you to do was prove this is true using sum and products. So for products and sums, who remembers the formulas for each? How do you find the product of roots? What was the product of roots listed as, Christian? It was like C over A. Very good. And the sum of roots was listed as? Negative Yeah. So what I wanted you to do more was to take these numbers, right, and plug them in in the corresponding locations. Then see if they match up with the numbers you have for intercept form. So if you got the product of roots, my product of roots should be around 240, right? Look at these two numbers here, Mauro. If I multiply these, A times C, or sorry, the product of R1 times R2 is around 240, I could see. The sum of these two roots would give me around 64, R1 plus R2. Well, you know what? If you use standard form with the A, B, and C that you determined, and you calculate this using C over A, do you get 240? That's the question. When you use negative U over A, do you get 64? That's the question. So all I wanted you to do was to prove, and you should have. If your data was correct, you should have gotten something close. So Sebastian asked me about this one, and his numbers were like, I think he ended up getting 144 was the product of his roots, but then he got 143.6. That's great, that's perfect, really. I mean, it's not perfect, obviously, but it's perfect as far as our, our concern, right? Your data cannot be that precise here. You're using estimations when it came to measuring. Even using a video of Bernier, 
there's still some room for like a little bit of deviation because you're picking those points. For those who did the video over here, remember you actually tap the points themselves. So there might be some deviation, but the idea is that they should be approximately close to whatever your actual summit products are. Okay, definitely a good question for the final exam. Okay, definitely a good question when it comes to this because if I give you A, B, and C, and you said the question says which of the following multiple choices could be the roots or could be this. You can do a quick check with product of roots and sum of roots and look at C over A and negative B over A to see what those values are, to see what they are. It's a good way of checking what the answer is. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, so for a root How so? Like, it wasn't like, it was like 2x squared minus 2x plus like 6.9 minus 0. And that seems like really wrong because then like you plugged it in. Why? There can't be a y in there. You're doing a y. That's what I explained. I'll be plugged it into like the calculators and it had the same points. You'd have to show me. I'd have to look at your stuff a little bit further, guys, to be honest. Um, but the idea behind it is that if you have three points, you plug into this right here, I'm circling in red into this general form. So let's say one of my, I can actually just give you a quick sketch. Let's say this point here is two comma three, this point here is five comma 28, and this point over here, let's say is on the other side of that, so that's gotta be, let's say, oh, I, won't, I don't use the same point actually, I use this one up here instead. Let's say this point over here instead is going to be seven comma 19. Okay, so let's just hypothetically use those three points. So this is what you did to start, right? All right, everybody, you start with three points. You take those three points and simply plug them into the function itself. So the first point, two comma three, three goes in for y, and two goes in for x. Second point, I plug in five, 28. 28 goes in for y, and five goes in for x. And the third point, 19 goes in for y, and 7 goes in for x. And that's how I would solve this. I would go ahead and write this as 4n, 2b, 25n, 5b, 49a, 7b. I would take my constants, put them on the right side as a constant vector, and my matrix for this becomes the following. My matrix for this problem becomes the following. It's going to be bracket, bracket, and I'm going to do it in order of the coefficients first. 4, 2, 1 for A, B, C. Remember, if you're forgetting this, I'll put the column headings up here. This is A, this is B, this is C, and this is your constant at the very end. The constant in this case was 3. Then I've got 25A squared, a uh, 25A plus 5b plus 1c equals 28, and then 49a plus 7b plus 1c equals 19. And at this point, the only way you can solve this is by using, I mean, you can do it by hand with elimination, this is going to take a while. Use the matrix, do RREF, and you will end up getting a matrix that looks similar to this, but has ones down the pivots and zeros elsewhere. And then the answers you get here are the values of A, B, and C. You will get three numbers, those three numbers A, B, C. So I'm not sure what happened exactly, guys, but you could have done the line equation, because it's not possible if you do it this way. But if you use video vernier and fit a curve to it, you may have done some other technique for curve fitting. So you should have tried to do it by hand. So you can go back and look at this again. Okay? But using video vernier could have done a curve fitting technique where it involved a line equation, but I'm not sure how it would and this is what you get, A, B, and C. And then your answer is just Y equals this number X squared plus this number times X plus this number at the very end of the problem. Good question, though, for the final because we're going to be using this, right? I'm going to definitely give you a question where it comes to solving either a system of two by two or uh, two variables, two equations, or three variables, three equations. It is good to know the matrix method so that you can actually check your work. Okay, so you can actually check your work. 
Uh, let me look something up real quick to give you some feedback. I want to tell you one thing. Um, I think we allow user calculator on the whole exam for this. So let's see if that's correct. I don't recall making a separate section only because I'm not sure if the other class does non-calculator parts altogether. Other questions on the project while I'm looking this up? Other questions at all on the project? No? Everybody feels pretty confident in it? Yeah, the work? Everybody's okay with vertex form? I mean, vertex form will definitely show up on your test. It's the only thing that hasn't really been asked yet. All right, here we go. Cover page. Calculator. Yes, I think we allow you guys to use it. Come on, open up. Yeah, you can use calculators in the whole test for the final. Okay? Now, obviously, questions are going to be made in a way so that the calculator can't always help you, you know? Like, there are going to be certain questions that don't have numbers with them, and they're not involved with numbers at all, so you can't use it. But you could use it to check all your work. So, hey, if it's multiple <laughs> choice, do you have to show any work for multiple choice? No. So, do me a favor, check out your calculator. Let's talk about some quick techniques that you can use for multiple choice help. Some of you do it, but others don't. Some of you don't, I'm going to get you. So, one thing that I'll jot down for some quick calculators. If you have any equation in a multiple choice that you're trying to solve, not evaluate, not evaluate, not simplify, but solve. Remember, solve means you're solving for x or y or z or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the equation is. It doesn't matter what. So, if I do log, oops, let's say I do log base 5 of x plus 2x equals 7. Something like that. And you're like, how am I going to solve this? We've never solved this before. We've solved log equations by going back to exponential. We could kind of do this as exponential if we wanted to. We could technically get a bit messy, right? So you might say, how do I solve this? When you solve an equation, you're looking for the what? What are you looking for? Intersection. Okay, we'll continue with this next class. And you can plug y1 as the left hand side and plug this in for y2 and just see where they intersect. And that gives you the x value, the x value of the intersection gives you the solution. So just a small calculator to take this one off. Please, in the next couple of days, your homework is to do what? Yeah, practice. So when you're practicing, you will get something where you want to ask a question, write down your notes. Right now, we know that you have to see about that question. Right? Please do so. Starting, starting in? Yeah, we have a map, but I didn't want to carry it around. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. well, a lot, a lot of things. Marcus. Check this out. Oh, oh, are you doing Velcro? Nice. You're doing Velcro? Good. I know. Some groups just... Guys, we'll see you tomorrow in class. Uh, it says burger, though. So, when can I do my calculator? When can I do my calculator? So, either tomorrow or Wednesday, all school. Uh, I'll let you know though. I gotta figure out where you're based. We're based for one of those two days. So whichever I know is fine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that is you, James and Yeah, I'm Yes. Can I figure out where you are? I'm not sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
my files. That is like a file storage thing. It's like seven racks. And you can get something that's like tiered up. So it's like a three level photo store. Oh, and then okay. I can help you put it together. That's you it. You know what I mean? Amazon, I'll go on. But but if you want if you no, want no. to like physically build something, I'm happy to work on it. But I'm just saying like no, you're busy. Wise, no, no, it's you're like you're easy for you too. No. You'd have to go out and buy wood for this kind of thing. Like this wood, you wouldn't want to no, get no, this. No, no, like, This is not, and it's not even pressure treated. I, it's, I, not, uh, it's not finished. Didn't even realize that you could do From this one? Yeah. Yeah, got it. What else? What other stuff do you want to discuss go over, for example, problems of. Uh, I forget what this was exactly, but it was like this from a clip where you had to like break up. The middle term? The middle term. Yeah, so AC method, we called it, but. Yeah, it's whenever the A value is not equal to 1. That's the problems you're looking at. So let me show you how to create these problems for yourself. Because I'm not going to just on the whim come up with a problem, but I'll show you And you'll have to be able to factor, even if it's not a quadratic problem. Okay, you see what I mean by that? Helps embed these other problems. So if you kept factoring that, so then like... I can't factor that, unfortunately. But if I could... Would X still two values? Correct. Yeah, and you have to try both those values. If one of those values makes the log argument negative, Cannot be considered one of the answers. You have to check. On the test, <laughs> question. On the test, some of you stop here or here and they try numbers, which is, I mean, I guess that works. Here's factor, right? Solve by factoring. And if it's not factorable, just simply solve it by using the quadratic formula. But once you get an answer, you have to remember to check it here and here. If your answer for x was negative 3, it would not work in either spot. If it makes either of the log arguments negative, it is not one of our solutions. You have to reject. Solution. Eduardo. Uh, no, I was just going to ask if you can go back to something similar to the Yep. Factoring when the C value. Look how you can make them. So watch what you do. Start, if you want to practice AC method, this is a good method to use to practice AC method. Give me two factors, and it doesn't matter what. So I'll start with like 2x plus 4. Uh, no, actually, don't put 4 because then you can factor out a 2. Right out of that. So let's make it 2x plus 3. And then on the other side, make it like. 3x minus 1. Okay? So I know my answers are going to be these already, right? Because I've already started with the factors. But now I'm going to foil it out, and then I'm going to go through AC method to prove that I know how to do it to get back to the solution. Obviously, on a test, you're not going to do all of this. You're going to be given just the quadratic. But I don't know. I can't just pick arbitrary values of A, B, and C, and I have a quadratic that will definitely work or be factorable. But if I start with factors, then I know whatever I get from this will indeed be factorable. So let me distribute this out. I get from the first one, 6x squared. Then from the outer terms, I get negative 2x. The inner terms, I get positive 9x. And then the last term, I get negative 3. So the quadratic that we're going to work on now is going to be the following. OK, so make believe everything above the black line you did not have. That's how you practice these problems on your own. So again. Take your factors on your own, foil them out, come up with the quadratic, and now using this quadratic, let's go through the factoring process. And obviously, you know those are the answers. I can see the answers, they're there. But we're making believe those answers are not there anymore, and we're going to practice this problem. Okay, so I'm just going to literally slide this off the screen now and make believe we're starting here. Okay, but these are the factors that we started with, so we should get back to these factors at the end of this problem. So let's go ahead and take this problem and take a look at it. So we start all these problems by recognizing that A is not 1. Whenever A is not 1, we can solve the problem by here. AC method, which is factoring still. Completing the square, which is messy when A is not 1. You know that. Divide by 6 everywhere for the square. Or quadratic formula. Any of those work really, right? But remember, the quadratic formula gives me the roots. Completing the square gives me the roots. This problem might just say factor it, right? Factor the expression below. You might not say find the roots. So if you use the quadratic formula, you have to then go backwards from your roots to get the factors, right? It's a little bit messy. So I wouldn't probably use the quadratic formula here if I'm just trying to factor. So I start by listing AC. What's AC equal to in this problem? Alex? Negative 18. Negative 18. It's the product of A and C, in case we're still wondering about that, right? The product of A and C. Now, what numbers multiply to give me negative 18 and add up to positive 7? What numbers multiply to this and add up to this in the middle? Uh, 9, negative 2. Yeah, 9 as a positive and negative 2 
as your negative quantity there. So I go ahead and I write my middle term as 9 and negative 2, but with the x tacked onto it. So I show, I'm showing you in blue. I've taken 7x and replaced it with its equivalent value, which is exactly what this is. At this point in time, I have to look at this problem as if there are two parts to it. So I need you to imagine a dashed line going down the middle like this. Factor by grouping. Factor by grouping. What comes out of the first two terms? Out of the first two terms? 3x. 3x. Leaving me with? Sometimes we struggle with what's left over. I know some people struggle with that. What's left over, Alex? Um, um, 2x plus 3. Very good. Now, 2x plus 3 is what's left over. So what has to be left over over here, Alex? Two. <coughs> Remember, whatever's left over has to be left over again. So what comes out of these two values to leave me with 2x plus 3? Negative 1. Negative 1. Now, since 2x plus 3 is in both terms, I'll factor that out in front. Oops, 3. And what's left over is 3x minus 1. And that is back to what we started with. So again, if you want to practice AC method, make up your own factors. Just make sure the A value does not turn out to be 1. So make sure these factors here have coefficients in front of them. Now, I'm going to give you a little hint. If you practice in your own and you make this 2x plus 4, then a 2 can come out of both of these, right? And it's going to make your problem a little messy later on. So I would recommend making both of these factors no more factors. I don't want these to be factorable anymore. Like 2x plus 3 can't factor any out. 3x minus 1 can't factor any out. Anything that leaves behind integer values, I should say. Have you seen the textbook yeah. just yeah. Good question. AC method, absolutely a topic that we should know. Factoring in general is a topic we should know. Again, factoring, we have completing the square, and we have the quadratic formula. Those are three methods used to solve quadratics, to solve them, to solve them. Sure. Completing the square, let's do one with the, let's do the tougher version, because if you can do the tougher version, you can do the easier version. Completing the square does not matter what you choose. You can pick any values. Now, with that said, I probably wouldn't pick an A value of like 27 or something very large, because it would make things very, very messy just for your arithmetic. So I would most likely pick a number on the test, like an A value of maybe 3. So let's start with 3x squared plus 5x minus 2 equals y. And the problem says determine, determine the zeros of the function. Determine the zeros of the function. When it tells you to determine the zeros of the function, what do you do to y? Uh, we set it to zero. Set it to zero. So it's literally the same equation, but with the zero when it says, and write down the directions on this, please. I'm, I'm, I'm dictating them, but you should write them down. The directions would say, determine the zeros of the function. Determine the zeros of the function. And I'm saying this because some of you understand the stuff in this class, but you confuse your wording. So if I say determine the zeros versus find the factors, those are different things. But determine the zeros is kind of the same thing as saying find the x-intercepts. Or determine the roots of an equation is the same thing as the zeros of a function. So we should know when those things mean the same thing and when they don't, when they differ. So completing the square. Step one. Step one. Move C over to the other side. 3x squared plus 5x equals 2. This is one of the only times that you will solve a quadratic or something that's higher than linear. Quadratic, cubic, fourth order. One of the only times you'll solve it number on the other side. Almost every other time we have a zero here and you factor this. Either with PQ method we did with the B's over Q's with, uh, for the rational root theorem or by factoring. But because I'm using the the square, I move it over first. I could get rid of the A first if I want to or move the two over first. It didn't matter. Up to you. Directions. If the directions say, which Helen they will, solve by completing the square, you have to use completing the square. But if it's just factor or find the roots or whatever, it doesn't give you any 
hint of it, do whatever you want. If it's multiple choice, we'll go back to remind me to go back to the calculators today, okay? We didn't get to finish that discussion last time. But if it's multiple choice, if it's multiple choice, then you can definitely just use your calculator, right? You do not have to factor when there's multiple choice. To solve an equation with multiple choice, remember we're just gonna find that intersection. We'll do an example of that later today. Remind me, please. So to complete the square, we next divide by the a value, and we leave everything in fraction form. x squared plus 5 thirds x equals 2 thirds. There's a reason we leave it in factored form, in, in, in fraction form. What is that reason? Why don't I put decimals everywhere right now? Not, not because they're you know, run on decimals, because they go on forever. Why don't I want to use decimals in these problems? Why do I use fractions? Yeah, easier to square and manipulate. So remember, what's the next rule tell us to do? What is the next thing we have to do, Helen? Good. Have the b value, square it, and both sides. What is half to five thirds? It's so easy. You don't have to think about it. Don't even think about it. What's half to five thirds? Five sixths. Because when you have something, don't you just double the denominator? So stop dividing fractions by two in your head. If you have a fraction, you want to have it, just double the denominator. So half of five thirds is five sixths. Let's square five sixths. That gives me 25 thirty-sixths. So I'm going to add 25 thirty-sixths to both sides. Again, where does 25 thirty-sixths come from? It's 5 sixths squared. Okay, that's what we're doing here. Now we're adding to both sides. We take half of this and square it. Now, there's a really, really convenient part to the next part of this problem. What is that part? What's the convenience factor here? Are you actually going to factor this left hand side right now? You're going to obviously do it, but you don't have to actually do it in your head, right? What is the answer of the left hand side always going to be? Always. Isn't it like x plus the b value squared equals x plus, not the b value squared, the b value and then like that third. Close, so close. Half of the b value. So this always, always becomes x plus whatever half of b is. What's half of 5 thirds again? What's half of 5 thirds? Five sixths. That will always happen. That's why this is a convenient method to use. We proved that true in class when we actually derived this formula here, remember? But you don't have to prove it on your exam. And no need to prove it on the exam. In college and math, you're going to do a lot of proofs. So if you like that kind of stuff, you're going to see more of it. You don't do it right here. So this is always half of whatever reason. The right hand side, I just have the common denominator. So let's make my common denominator 36. Two thirds is really how many 36? Very good. So multiply by 12 over 12 gives you, like you said, 24. And 24 and 25 gives me 49 36 This happens to work out pretty nicely, right? So I guess the original that I came up with was factorable. Because, what, you think about it, right? Am I going to take a square root next? Isn't this a perfect square? This becomes what? 7 over 6. Whenever it turns out to be a perfect square on the right hand side, it means that the original was actually factored in the first place. The original problem in this could have been factored, is what this means. Let's see what those factors would have been. Alex, what's up? Yeah? We need to know, because I'm going to read that one passage and proof on this. We need to know that. No, there's no, no proofs or anything like that at all. No. I think I, it, was, it wasn't a proof, it was like a statement reason column. You had to give the reasons for the justifications, right? Yeah, that's not, no, you're not going to have any proofs or anything. So let's take the square root of both sides. What do I have to remember? What do I have to remember on the right-hand side? Isabella? Plus or, minus. plus or minus. Two roots, right? Two roots. You have to have a plus or minus symbol on the right-hand side. And then I take 5 sixths and add it over as a negative 5 sixths. Remember I talked about this? Instead of subtraction, I'm going to add negative 5 sixths to both sides in front. That gives me an answer or answers of negative 5 plus 7 all over 6, which is going to be 2 sixths or 1 third. 
And the other answer would be negative 5 minus 7. That would be negative 12 over 6, which is negative 2. So what this tells me is that this original statement, God bless you, could have been factored into 3x minus 1 and x plus 2. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and solve those factors, right? Solve these factors set equal to 0. You've got x equals negative 2. Here, add the 1, divide by 3. You've got x equals 1 third. So whenever you get an answer that is rational, even if it's a fraction, anything that is rational means the original could have been factored. Not that that matters, because once you've done this, you can go back and factor it. No, of course not. So if you're doing a problem by completing the square and you get an answer, just stop that answer. Okay, but make sure to simplify as far as possible here. Okay, if you can do that for completing the square, you should be more than fine for the test for completing the square. It's not going to be anything more difficult than that for completing the square. How do you get 5, 6, 4? For right here, sir? Yeah. Whatever this is, remember we took half of it, and half of this was 5, 6, and then we squared it to get this? This will always turn out to be that. And if you do the math, think of this as x plus 5, 6, x plus 5, 6. If you foil it out, you end up getting 25 over 36, we multiply 5, 6 by 5, 6. And then 5 6 plus 5 6 is 10 sixths, which is 5 thirds. So it's just a technique that always works out. So we want to remember this this number is always going to be whatever half of this was, whatever this was. Okay? But yeah, the reason is that you have two factors here, really. And foiling them out, we get back to this. It's just messy to have to factor fractions, so we just remember that it's always half of b. It just helps. Good question. Next, next question you want to add. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, Isabella. I'm, really, I'm not sure like, what it actually was, but we did a lot of stuff with radicals, and I know that confused me a lot. A lot of stuff with radicals? The more recent stuff with radicals? Like, like simplifying them, and like, I don't know what it was. I'm trying to find it. So something like this. Let's try this. Let's try third root of x to the seventh, y to the sixth, z to the negative two. Something like that. Okay. And let's say the problem says simplify as much as possible. Okay, simplify as much as possible. Now, we have recently learned this topic again, haven't we? Remember, we got with logs and exponents, and we started talking about how the index, really the exponent, the denominator, and stuff. So you can take either approach. You can take the approach earlier in the year or later. Or maybe both. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so I'm going to do this twice. I'll put this at the very top middle. On the left-hand side, I'll take the earlier approach from earlier on in the year. Earlier in the year, we didn't know about rational exponents. So we just separated this into perfect and non-perfect cubes. So if you remember from earlier in the year, I would have broken this up into x to the sixth, y to the sixth, and then times x, z to the negative 2. That's how I would have broken this up from earlier in the year. Can somebody explain why I broke it up that way? Why did I put these here and whatever's left over over here? What's the whole reason why I broke it up? Um, well, when there's like ex um, different exponents, you can multiply them by them. So um, if you have x, this is y, this is the return to x squared y squared. So in this case, why is it x squared y squared is my question for you. You're right. Why did I bring 6 out? For example, right, I started with 7. How come I didn't choose 5, or 4, or 3, or 2, or 1 to bring out in front? Why did I choose 6? Uh, yeah. Remember that I want this number to be a multiple of this number. And I want this number to be as large as I can make it. Well, the most I can make it is 7. 7 is not a multiple of 3, so I go down 1, which is 6. Oh, 6 is a multiple of 3. So this becomes, on the left-hand side, x squared, y squared. Now this is times. Now if I wanted to write this, I could write it like this. Like that, I could leave it. All right, I'm allowed to do that. I can leave it like this, it doesn't matter. Or maybe I could write it back the way it was instead. All right, I could write it like this instead. x squared times like that. Or maybe it's a multiple choice. Maybe it's a multiple choice in the final, and the answer looks like this. Oops. 
Maybe it's a multiple choice. And the answer says x squared, y squared times x to the one-third, z to the negative two-thirds. That's technically right also. Remembering that the third root is really a third power. Third root is the same thing as a one-third power. This really has a one. One-third. Negative two over three is negative two-thirds. Now, forget the early year approach. If that's confusing you, start with the new stuff. So instead, on the right-hand side, I will automatically start by writing this as the following. Okay? I'll start by taking the cube root and write it as a one-third right off the bat, and then distribute the one-third to everything. <coughs> now, maybe that's my answer, and I stop there. Maybe that's the multiple choice, and I leave it at that. Or maybe the multiple choice breaks us up a little bit further and separates it like we had here. But again, it depends on the problem that's given to you. If the problem says simplify with all positive exponents, this is the answer choice I'll make. Right? Simplify with all positive exponents. This one doesn't have all positive. This one doesn't have all positive. This one does. This one kind of does, but it also has radicals. Instead of all positive exponents, I would choose the one in the list. Okay? The idea behind this is that you can take either approach. You get the same answer. This is the same thing as this. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Alex, good. Uh, it's, got, it's kind of a dumb question. That's not good. Um, what was that? It's like function notation or set notation when you're doing inequalities? When you're doing inequalities, interval notation yeah. versus set notation? Yeah, let's talk about that. So let me quality said the following. Absolute value x plus 1 is less than or equal to 6. Okay? And I'm doing this on purpose. We've covered two topics at once, you know? So this is absolute value inequalities. We've done inequalities. We've done absolute value. We're putting these two together here. Absolute value inequalities tell me to start by rewriting what I see. And then to, on the other side, write the same thing, but switch the sign and negate the term. So take a look at what I've written. I write the same thing I see without the absolute value, and then I flip the sign and negate the constant on the right-hand side. If I solve these separately, I get x is less than or equal to 5, and x is greater than or equal to negative 7. Now, can x be less than or equal to 5 and greater than or equal to negative 7, or is it an or statement? Which one is it in this case? Let's make believe you don't know, right? No, no one has their hand up, hypothetically. I know some of you do. Let's say you don't know. Less than 5, or less than or equal to 5 is this. Greater than or equal to negative 7. Where do they overlap? Where do they overlap? Yeah, good. Between negative 7 and Yeah. So this is an and statement. And this, if you remember means and. If it's a greater than symbol, when it's an absolute value, it meant or. That was something that we picked up on. We picked up on throughout the process. That's all we picked up on. But this region is my solution set. So let's go to what Alex was asking in the first place. Alex wanted to know about set notation and interval notation. So in this case, it would be brackets. Yes, absolutely. But before I get to interval, let's do set. Because set's the one we're more common with. So let's say set notation, we go, we say this squiggly bracket, which you don't really need the squiggly bracket. It's not the end of the world. And we just define the variable as x. And x ranges from negative 7 up until x up until 5, or through x up until 5. That's the answer in set notation. Another way to represent this in set notation is using this right here that I'm circling and putting the word and between it. Technically speaking, this is the same exact thing as this. There's no difference. We're allowed to express them either way, and they're both correct. Now, interval notation, we start at negative 7. We end up at 5. We include negative 7, and we include 5. So we have brackets on both. So set notation, or what you see in blue, interval notation is in black at the very bottom here. 
Now, interval notation, Alex, if there are several parts to the answer, what are they separated by? What symbol, do you remember? Interval notation, what symbol? Like a capital U, remember? The union of. So if there were hypothetically an answer, let me just do this make believe. I'm making believe our answer was this. Say so that's our answer, okay? In the top right. In interval notation, how would you represent that? In interval notation. X is less than negative seven. Start with that, Regina. Um, Good. And then the U thing. Good. And then we do six with a bracket. Very good. And then comma infinity with parentheses. Very good. Infinity always has parentheses. You think of the number of parentheses as you can't take on that value. Infinity is a limit. We talked about that already this last couple of times. Infinity is not really a value, it's a limit. Okay, it's a, a, a function tends to go toward. Goes toward. So that would be our notation in interval notation. Okay, for the same exact answer up here. These are two separate problems, right? We know these are not the same problem. I just want you to see the notation differ. And you have an or statement versus an and statement. It's conjunctions and disjunctions is just the same. Disjunction is or, conjunction is and. Yeah? Good to know your terminology always, right? It could show up in multiple choice for sure. So terminology is always important. Yes? I don't, did we go over the test yet? No. You want to ask, if it's about logs, I'm definitely have to go, yeah. Seven. yeah. Thank you. So number seven is the one that talks about the value of a baseball card increasing at a certain rate every year. Okay, I'm going to start with my formula. That's my formula that I use for all of these problems, really. Only time I ever use this formula is when it's in investments that is compounded with interest rates. This has nothing to do with interest rates. It tells you that it increases at a certain rate. The value itself increases. There's not an interest rate applied. So don't confuse this with y or a equals p1 plus r over n to the nt. Now, it says that the rate it increases at is 12% per year. It says that the rate is, in, or the value is increasing. So I know right away that when I use this problem, it's going to be 1 plus. We're told that we want the card to triple in value. Triple in value. So I don't know what the value is to start. But I do know that the value at the end is going to be triple whatever I start with. So you can pick a number if it helps you. Some of you got confused with this. Pick a number. The card starts at 5. Well, what's triple 5? 15. So make this a 5, make this a 15. Make this a 10, make this a 30. Make this a 100, make this 300. Does it matter? No. Because either way, when you divide through, what do you get? 3. You're always going to get 3, no matter what choice of numbers you pick here. Again, we're solving for x. That's unknown in the exponent. But for now, let's just pick numbers so you guys can see that. So if I make this 100, well, actually, that's a bad number to pick. If I make this 300, and I make this 100, Right? It triples in value. Or I make this 3,000 and make that 1,000. It still triples in value. But what's your first step when you're solving for something with the variables in the exponent? What do I want to do first? First you have to divide Yeah, so if I call this 1,000 or 100 or whatever it is, I got to divide by it. No matter what it is, it's going to be some number divided by a third of its number. So you're always going to get 3 on the left-hand side. So again, if I didn't want to use numbers, forget numbers for a second, call this A, and then this is 3A. What's on both sides? A. So A cancels, leaving you with this equation. Now, somebody just has more. What do I do now when I want to solve for a variable in the exponent when I'm at this stage right here? You have to convert it to logs. Write yourself a note, because a lot of you struggle with this on the test. When the variable is in the exponent, 
Convert to logs, convert to logs, convert to logs. There's one exception to that, and we've seen it, and I'll go over it next. But this becomes log. The base remains the base, so 1.12 is still the base. The argument is 3, and that equals x. And then you can think of this as multiple choice on the test. It would be this. Okay, that would be your answer on a multiple choice question. I would definitely express it in change of base form or in log base 10 form. Now, another fun fact, not fun because I get a lot of trouble with this, but another fact to point out, if you look at number one on the test, the first problem of the test, the logical number wrong. At one point in that first problem, there was a point where you had log of 10. What's log base 10 of 10? It's one. That was the mistake a lot of people made on number one, okay? There was a point in time when you solved this equation and you have a log base 10 of 10. You simplify that to be a one. That's where some of you really had a little bit of trouble there. So those log rules do come into play, right? Log base 10 of 10 is one, or log base b of b is one. Yeah, what was the, read, read the exact equation for it. 10 to the 5t equals 2. So convert to logs right away. Yeah, so far? Yeah, that's so far. Then I change, well then I change base. But log base 10 of 10 is just 1. So this is really just log 2. And then divide by 5. Okay. So again, the key is to recognize this. This is the part that we're struggling with. Log base 10 is 1. Log base 10 of 10 is 1. So that's just a 1, and you get log 2 over 1, which is log 2. Divided by 5 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 fifth. I think the answer is a 1 fifth in the choice. That's why I put a 1 fifth there. But you could have just divided by 5, right? It's the same thing. Instead of multiplying by 1 fifth, you could have written this answer as Log base, log base 10 of 2 all over 5. Either expression is okay, red or blue. More. So we have two formulas. That's formula one. And this was formula two. You're only going to use this formula when you have compounded interest. It will say in the word, comp in the problem, compounded interest. Or compounds per year. The word compound will be in there to talk about the end value. So if it's compounded monthly, if interest is taken into account, compound is taken into account. Every month, and is 12. If it's taken into account every day, and is 365. Every week, and is 52. So the only time you're going to use this bottom one is when it's compounded interest. Everything else tomorrow, you use the top equation. Doubling, half life, yeah, increasing at a specific rate, you're always going to use the top equation. The only time you use it, the bottom one is compounded interest. And so for doubling, if you want to Yeah, because what does doubling mean? Doubling means you have an interest rate of a, or rate of 100%, right? Growth. So the doubling formula comes from this. If you let the rate equal 100%, it means you doubled, you gained 100%. This equation becomes y equals a, and then 1 plus 1 is 2, and that's where the doubling equation comes from. And then the half-life equation also comes from this. When it's half of it left, it means the rate of decrease was 50%. So this becomes y equals a times 0.5 to the x, and that's a negative 50% there, right? And that's a positive 100% for that one. So again, when you double something in value, its value goes up by 100%. When you have something, don't go there. When you have something, its value goes down by 50%. So I'm adding one as the r value at the top and negative two. When I'm subtracting 0.5, one minus 0.5 is 0.5. Listen. 
Today, tomorrow, I will be after school. I will not on Thursday. We have a baseball meeting on Thursday. We have a baseball meeting on Thursday. So please, if you want extra help beyond what we're going to do in class tomorrow and Thursday, so I'll have you guys the next two days. If you want more help, stay today or stay tomorrow. So if you decide, but I'm available for these next two days. Okay? If you want to go, you can go. If you want to hang out and ask more questions, I'll stay for an hour. I don't mind. I'd rather agree with you guys. I'm not going to come to more the reason I'm not doing more is because I have to do more as well here. That's all right. Is that how we Guys, today or tomorrow after school, hang out if you'd like to, or come back tomorrow. For those that are hanging out, give me a minute to just throw some stuff in the fridge and put stuff away, and I'll be right back. I mean, do your best if you want to keep it. It's up to you. There's some soap next door in the chem lab and in the bio lab if you want a little bit of soap to help with it. All right, so I have both classes here, so I'm going to go back and forth. So I'll start with Matt. Did you guys want to go over your recent tests or will you give tests? Tests, and I have um, questions about the final review thing. I have good questions for this thing. Okay. Come on, did you want to go over your tests at all also over here? Take a minute to look at that, the two of you guys. Let me start with Matt, and then I'll go back and forth. 
Uh, Ella, Alex, Helen, talk to me. What do you want to do? Okay. You guys know the prime she's talking about? Number two. Whenever things are whenever things are inverses of each other, they have to have symmetry over the line y equals x. Number three. Oh. I got it right here. That's what you're using. So for number two, the answer was D because there was symmetry about the line y equals x. And that's the line right there, y equals x. So if I ever want to draw inverses of each other, let's say my original function is an arbitrary function. Let's say it's this. Okay, actually that's not a good idea because that's not going to be a function. Let's try it. Okay. Well, I can draw the inverse of this function very easily. Very easily. I just turn my head, and whatever I see over here, I draw over here. When I see that, I draw that. When I see that, I draw that. You see what I'm saying? So, Helen, Alex, Isabel, watch the way I'm going to draw this, okay? I'm going to take each section and just draw its image on the other side. Now, do you see how those are inverse of each other? So I literally took what's in black and reflected it over that line to draw the new line. So the yellow line is the inverse function of the black line. And then you see the front or the bridge yet? Um, I assume you use the conditional by itself to do that. Because I tried using that at Raven, but that's good. 400 milligrams is a starting value, that's A. So you plan on how many of these time periods elapse to solve for x, and then divide that into eight. There will be four time periods elapse, and if that takes eight minutes, each time period is. So solve for x, and then you take care of the minutes. On the test, number eight. Now that is true if there's interest rate that's compounded annually, only once a year. You get all 5% at the end of the year. But what does it say? You take the rate, you divide it by 12, but then you take the time and you multiply it by 12. What you're doing is you're breaking up the time intervals. It's instead of being 7 years, right, you're doing 12 times 7 exponent, which tells you how many months you're actually going to be compounding interest. That's why the rate you're going to use is going to be the monthly rate instead. Because it's 5% per year, right? So by dividing by 12, you get the monthly rate. So if you think about this, Helen, this is the monthly rate when this is 12. 12 times the number of years is the number of months. Yeah, so it's still going to be time periods in a sense. I did 12 times 4, I just Because then you did 48 months, or you did 12 times 4, you made 48 so years then. At 5% per year. Yeah, okay? So you have to reduce the amount of percentage there. Okay. 
So if a problem says that, and that's fine because earlier in the year, well, not fine for that problem, but for the final. Earlier in the year, we talked about linear functions and growth. And the way you did it is fine if it were a linear function. It would state the following is represented by a linear function. So when it says exponential growth, you automatically go right to your formula, which is this. Then you plug in your knowns. So you knew there were 72,000 of them. You started with 24,000. So 72,000 goes in for y. 24,000 is your starting value. You're trying to figure out what the interest rate is. You know that how many time periods have elapsed? Four hours, right? So you're finding the interest rate per hour. It's basically it's solid for r. Exponential growth. Yeah, and logarithmic. So yeah, for a linear function, you're fine, but it wasn't a linear function. And this test was all on exponential growth. So you have to also use your context, right, to recognize that piece? Number four. Um, all you Good. All you do is just plug each of the things into each other. Right? Correct. You do f of g of x and g of f of x. Now, Alex, when you do that, you need to get x as an answer to prove that they're inverses. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't get x out as your answer, they're not inverse to each other. So if your answer is 2x, then you can say, oh, it's not an inverse. So that one either wasn't an inverse? That problem, they were inverses. You should have got equal to x at the end. You should have been able to do, yeah, you got it for one of them, and then the other one you didn't. You know what? When you get it for one of them, it's most likely going to be for both of them. But you should still check both, because there's a chance it could be. Mm -hmm. Read me the original. Two, wait, sort of a two log. No base, okay, so I don't have to say it. So 2 log what? start this problem by making this log of m squared minus log k plus log of c to the one-third. Right, so we bring the exponents up first. So far so good? Then what's in parentheses can be combined because you're subtracting that whole thing. So I want one whole term there. So what does this become if I combine it? I'll leave the first one alone. If I combine log k plus log c with the one-third, what is that going to be? Um, log k times. Times? Good. Okay. Remember, you're always getting rid of log. You also carried a couple extra logs there, if you notice, right? Now that you have subtraction between two log functions. Correct. Now, remember, you only get rid of the log once because you still, it's a log function, right? You're condensing the log, you're not getting rid of it altogether. So these two separate log functions condense into one log function with one argument. That's a good example for that. On the next page, I give you an example where you did condensing, right? No, expanding, and then, yeah, number six. But then I gave you the values of the expanded terms, right? So practice number six, that's the new one. Sophie, do you want to see your test? Um, no, I have a question about... Problems and stuff? Okay. Math, I'm going to pause for a sec just to be fair and come back to you guys. Okay. Chapter 13, Chapter 13. In this problem? Yeah. Okay, so to find x new, 
what we have to do is figure out what the horizontal transformation was, which comes from H. Well, whatever H is, you have to ask yourself, right? Ask yourself this. I'm going to point, okay? X minus what number gives me X plus 1? It's like the vertex form from the quadratics. Yeah. H was the opposite and K was the same thing you saw. That was it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Clement, Sophie, then Katie slash Peter, whoever's next there, go ahead. The discriminant, like the rules, like when you set A equal to zero. Yeah. Like, All right, so let's start real quick by talking about first the quadratic formula, right? The quadratic formula, which is where the discriminant comes from. So we start by saying this. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. This quantity right here is the discriminant, right? b squared minus 4ac. Why does it matter so much? Why are the three cases positive, zero, or negative? Like, why are these my, these my three cases here that matter? We'll talk about what they mean in a minute. But why does it matter if the discriminant is where it is, why it's positive, negative, or zero? What do you think, Why? Again, that's the answer to this. My question is, why is it associated with where it is in the formula and stuff? Give me more. Give me more. Okay. Oh, because the plus or minus lets you know like, what kind of answer it'll be. So like, if it was zero, it's plus or minus, that's one solution. If it's like, less than zero, it's going to be two, but it's going to be like, a negative number. And if it's more than greater than zero, it's a two. Um, by combining the conscience. By combining the conscience. So there are three cases. And what matters is what Valentina was getting to. She got the most of that. I think I'm going to add one piece to what she said, though. So when it's zero, right, when the discriminant equals zero, we get a problem that looks like this. Right? And then that's kind of weird, right? Because look, don't you recognize this? Do you guys recognize that formula? Where's negative b over 2a come from? Where's that come from? Well, it's the axis of symmetry. It's the axis of symmetry. And these kind of graphs right here that have only one root, does anybody remember what they look like? So we're looking at this case first. This is the easy one to start to look at. Anybody remember what the graph looks like when you only have one real repeated root? One real repeated root. What does the graph look like? Doesn't it, but isn't the vertex like on the x-axis? Yes, it is tangent to the x-axis. It literally touches the x-axis in one location. Now, the rationale, the reasoning behind this, we can see this formula becomes negative b over 2a. Well, that's the same location the axis of symmetry would go through. So it's not a coincidence that when you simplify and you have a zero discriminant, that you get negative b over 2a as your root, but also it's your axis of symmetry. Because the axis of symmetry goes through your root in this problem or in this case. So that's the one case when the discriminant equals zero. The other two cases, I don't really care as much about the graph, but I do care about whether it's positive or negative where. Where is the positive discriminant or the negative discriminant physically located? Where is it, where is it physically located? Is it outside of the radical? Is it a multiplier? Is it in the denominator? Is it in the numerator? Where is it? Inside the radical. A positive inside the radical means that we have a real number. It may be irrational, depending on if it's a perfect square or not, but it's a real number. But a negative under a radical indicates an imaginary answer. So it's important to recognize that these three cases come from looking at what's inside of the radical, really. So it's rational or irrational. We don't know. It just depends on if it's a perfect square or not. Whereas down here, the roots are imaginary. And in this case, we have one repeated. So those are my three cases, but it's important to see why they come about, or where they come about from. They come about from what's underneath the radical, which is why we call the discriminant b squared minus 4ac. So we have to be able to apply these kinds of problems. So if, it, if a problem tells us, you know, determine the value of the unknown coefficient if the roots are imaginary, well then you find the discriminant instead of less than zero. If the roots are real, you 
find a discriminant set greater than zero. Or if you have one real repeated root, then you use the discriminant equal to zero. But it depends on the problem given. So the imaginary is not a floating graph. It is, yeah. The graph of when you have the discriminant that is less than zero, the graph will look something either like that, or maybe like this, or even like this, or it could be anywhere, but it cannot be crossing the x-axis is the key. Whereas the original one up here at the top, the rational and irrational example, this graph, God bless you, this graph crosses the x-axis at two spots, or maybe crosses over here at two spots, right? Or maybe crosses over here at two spots. Any of those are possibilities for that. So yes, we have three cases. One case where you have two x-intercepts, and that's where the discriminant is positive. One case when you have only one x-intercept, and the graph is tangent to the x-axis, that's when the discriminant equals zero. And the third case, when you graph and the discriminant is negative, you have no real x-intercepts, so the graph is floating, we use the phrase, right, floating. But the other kind of problem, we can consider these, right, where you have And I purposely do this. I'm doing this to annoy you, and I know it's going to be annoying. I'm putting C as the barrier for coefficient for x. What do we call that usually, though? We usually call that B. But I can call it whatever I want. I can call it V. I can call it W. I can call it K. You see a lot with K. What you need to recognize is that based on what the problem is asking, you have to utilize that value and solve. So let's say the problem says, determine the value of C so that you have two real roots. Determine the value of c, which is your coefficient for the linear term right here. Determine the value of c so that you have two real roots. Well, you have three cases. Which of these three cases gives you two real roots? The first case, when the discriminant is positive. So let's figure out the discriminant. The discriminant is whatever b is, which in this case is c, right? You see what I'm saying? That's why I did this on purpose. It's b squared minus 4ac. And that has to be greater than 0. Again, I know the letter c is there. It's probably confusing some of you right now. I'm doing this on purpose so you recognize that these letters are just placeholders. When I do the discriminant, it's middle coefficient squared minus 4 times the first coefficient times the last coefficient. I'm using words like first coefficient, middle coefficient, and last coefficient to avoid A, B, and C, right? That's why I'm doing that in my head right now. But it's always this squared minus 4 times this times this. Again, this squared minus 4 times this times this. I'm not memorizing it as b squared minus 4ac when I say it, because I don't want to confuse myself with letters right now. But it's always this squared minus 4 times this times this. And that's all written right here. And then you would just solve. 8 times 7 is 56. How do I solve a problem like this? Yeah, kind of. It's not the answer, though, unfortunately, right? I could say c equals plus or minus square root of 56, but it's not true, right? This is not true. When I have an inequality and it's a quadratic, my solutions are not called solutions. They are called? They are called? Not roots, no. Another word. When it's a quadratic, this is a quadratic. Take a look. The variable that you're looking for is c and square, so it's a quadratic. And it's an inequality. Quadratic inequalities, we graph them on number lines by identifying the what? The blank points. The blank points. Critical, critical points. These are not my answers, remember. These are my critical points. I have to then take this and go ahead and graph it. Root 56, where is that? Go ahead. How could you get turned the Again, I can't. That's why I'm saying these are called critical points. This is not true. C equals plus or minus root 56 is not true whatsoever. These are my boundaries. Remember, whenever we graph something and we're trying to solve a quadratic, the solutions to a quadratic when it's an inequality 
we do not call solutions on a critical point. They're going to act with boundaries on the number line. So I'm not solving. Okay? It's, a, it's a very good question, Laura. Not actually solving. What do, where's Route 56 approximately? Yeah, between seven and eight. Okay. There's root 56. We'll put a zero there, and we'll put negative root 56. We don't really need the zero. Actually, I'm going to erase the zero because that annoys me. A lot of you guys use that as a separate area. Right now, I have how many regions? How many regions of the number line do I have? Three. I have three regions. I have three regions. I have the region to the left of root 50, negative root 56. I've got the region between negative 56 and root 56. And then I've got the region to the right of that. I need to test all three regions and see which of them turns out to be greater than zero. I'm going to test points in this line right here. Okay? In the part before we actually solve. So let's pick points. Here I would test zero. And since Alex just told me that root 56 is between 7 and 8, right? A number to the right of that would be 8. So let's test 8 over here. And over here, let's test negative 8. I don't usually write the numbers that I'm testing. I'm just doing that for now to help you guys out a little bit. I don't usually write that, but I'll put the numbers that I'm testing. Now, where do I test these three values? I test them here. Remember, wherever you have the inequality greater than or less than 0 is where you want to test it. Because we want to know... When is this region or which regions are greater than zero? So by testing in here, I can get a value and see if this region is greater than zero, less than zero, greater than zero, or less than zero, greater than zero, less than zero. Some of you have picked up on this, by the way, I've noticed, and that's fine. And you don't even test it in your head. If you look at this graph, which way is the quadratic going to open for a graph like this? What does a graph like this look like? X squared minus 56. What does that graph physically look like? Yeah, and it slides down 56 units, right? It's a minor set all the way down there. But the graph opens up. So that means that the middle region is going to be a low region. So this is going to be a negative. And the side region is going to be above it, aren't they? So these are both going to be positive. So I can tell you that already based on the shape of this graph. And we've done that a couple times. I had you guys graph this to see it. But if you don't want to do it that way, just test. Go ahead and test. So let's test zero. If I test zero up here, remember I'm testing zero right here. I get 0 squared minus 56. That's just negative 56. So this region turns out to be a negative region here. And then if I test 8, 8 squared is 64. 64 minus 56 is positive. So the right region is positive. OK, again, remember where I'm testing. I'll put an arrow in case we're forgetting this. I'm testing back up here. And I'm testing each region one at a time. And then I'll test negative 8. Negative 8 squared, well, that's also 64. 64 minus 56 is still a positive number. So this region on the far left is positive as well. So based on my c value, my discriminant will change. Okay? When, the, when, the, when the value of c is greater than 56, the discriminant is positive. When the value of c is between negative root 56 and root 56, the discriminant is negative. When the value of c is less than negative root 56, the discriminant is positive. These signs here are telling me about my discriminant because on top, that's my discriminant. c squared minus 56 is the discriminant. Right? This came from this, and this was your discriminant. So these three symbols are really coming from the discriminant. So in this region, we could say, well, when is the discriminant greater than 0? It's greater than 0 when x is less than negative root 56 or when x is greater than positive root 56. That's when the discriminant is greater than 0. That's when we have two real roots. Two real about when I want to know when there are imaginary roots. When there are imaginary roots, what should the discriminant be? When there are imaginary roots, what should the discriminant be? Yeah, and that's this region right here. So from negative root 56 to positive root 56, any value of c in there, any value, will give you a discriminant that is less than 0. So if c is a number that is like 1, 2, 
3. Those all fall in that range. Any of those numbers for C would give you a graph that would not have, would not have any x-intercepts. Because again, the discriminant would be less than 0, or the roots would be imaginary. And when is this actually graph going to have only one real repeated root when the discriminant equals 0? And Eduardo, this kind of goes back to your question. If you want to know when there's only one root, the discriminant would equal 0. This would equal 0, and then this equal would actually be the answer. It would not be an inequality, then. there would not be critical points. So for the case where the discriminant equals 0, that's when you have only one real repeated root. Only one real repeated root. Um, know your discriminant. Know how to use it. I mean, you should be able to do this kind of a problem, but this is a lengthier problem. So if this showed up, it would be worthwhile, meaning it would be worth like two or three points. It would not be worth one point because it takes a little while. Okay, so if you're doing a problem with a discriminant in a part two that's worth one point, and you get to have to do all this work, there's a good chance you're going to mistake along the way. Okay, recognize that the point value is also indicative of the length of the problem or the actual value it take you to do that problem. Keep that in your mind as you're taking the test. Uh, anything else about discriminant that I want to refer to? No, that's it for discriminant. What else? What other stuff? Sure. This was chapter eight, right? All right. So for chapter eight, this is one of the few chapters that you might want to pick good problems for. And I talk about that because it's not always going to be the case that this thing will factor nicely. So if you try problems that you pick arbitrary values, you might be stuck for a while and get no results and not actually practice it well. So if I'm you, I would probably be looking in the textbook for the PQ method in like section eight five. Section 8, 7, I think, is the other one. Yeah, 8, 5, and 8, 7 is the one I would look at for examples. And it really doesn't matter which one you try. The examples all seem to work well. So let's say we have, let me use a problem that works nicely. Okay, let's say we've got this. And our goal is to figure out what are the x-intercepts of this graph? Well, we can't, obviously, use the quadratic formula not a quadratic, right? And every term does not have a GCF Because the first thing you want to think about is, can I factor x out of everything, right, to make it a quadratic? But you can't. You can't factor x out of everything. So we recognize here that we cannot use our traditional factoring techniques. Grouping will not help here, so we have to go to PQ method. Okay, whenever we have a polynomial that's beyond x squared, you should probably go to PQ, unless you can factor out a GCF. So if it's x cubed, but everything has x in it, then you can take an x out, and then it becomes x squared as a result. So what is p over q? p are the factors of the constant at the end. q are the factors of the leading coefficient. Factors of 10 are 1, 2, 5, and 10. Factors of q. Just one. So those are my four possible, eight possibilities of roots for this problem. So my roots can be plus, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus five, plus or minus ten. Those are my eight possible roots. Remember, it's always over whatever the Q factors are, but Q is one. Q is one. So that made this problem nice and easy for us. Now, how do I test if something is or is not a root? What technique did we develop and use that looks like this to test if something is or is not a root? Synthetic division. Yes, we use synthetic division. And if you recall, along the top, we put the coefficients. Notice my coefficients. On a test, some of you made this mistake. If something is missing in the polynomial, what do we put in its place? Zero place. Again, x squared is not in the polynomial function. Look back up here. You don't see x squared anywhere. So it's 1x cubed plus 0x squared plus 1x plus 10 at the end. Now, which of these numbers do I test? That's up to you to decide. We did not get a lot of time to spend on Descartes' rule because we kind of added logs this year. In the past, I've done a little more. And it helps students to guess and check. Now, 
on your final, you are allowed to use your calculator on the whole thing. So should you start this problem by just trying, you know, 10, 5, negative 1, negative 5, should you arbitrarily be picking? No. It's not logical. You can have a resource like a tool like a calculator that you need to show your work. My recommendation would be graph in your calculator, get an idea of where it crosses the x-axis, look for one of those roots, and then as a result, maybe you can find the other roots as well. Okay, maybe you can. And if you did that, if you go ahead and graph this in your calculator, you know what you'll notice? You'll notice that it looks like it crosses around negative two. Okay, it crosses around negative two. So I'm gonna assume you guys know how to use your calculator. If not, take it out and practice it. If you have no idea what I'm saying right now, you need to go to your calculator and plug this in. Take the original function and go ahead, I'll, I'll circle or I'll put a box around it in gold. Plug that into y1. x cubed plus x plus 10. Plug that into y1. x cubed plus x plus 10. To get the cube, you can use a carrot, right? x cubed then plus x plus 10. Not x squared, right? And it should look like it crosses at negative two. Do you see it crossing anywhere else in your graph? I don't see it crossing anywhere else. I'm looking at it from your graphs. And do I have to test roots beyond 10 and 20? No. Or beyond 10 and negative 10? No. Because those are my biggest values here. Remember, this is called what root theorem? So is this going to show me the irrational roots? No. So I could, theoretically, Theoretically, I could have roots of like plus or minus root 20, no, plus or minus root 115. Because root 115, isn't that beyond 10? And root negative, and God bless you, and negative root 115, that's beyond negative 10. So if you're graphing and you're hitting zoom 6, your graph only shows you from negative 10 to 10. So I just walked around real quick and saw a couple of your graphs from negative 10 to 10. This is all you see. That's what the graph of this looked like. I, mean, I saw this on a bunch of your screens. Then you went from negative 10 all the way to positive 10. So there is a possibility, there is a possibility that your other two roots lie beyond 10 and negative 10 as irrational roots. There's a possibility. But we want to know if that's for certain. So we use synthetic division to test. Let's go ahead and test negative 2. We start by bringing down the first thing. Whatever's here, you bring it down. We then remember we have to multiply these two and add it to the next column heading. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus this 0 here is still negative 2. I then go ahead and take negative 2 times negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 gives me positive 4. Then plus the 1 here gives me a positive 5. And then I take the negative 2 times the 5 is negative 10. Plus 10 is? What does that mean, Alex? Why does it work? There's no remainder. Very good. No remainder means that x plus 2 must be a factor of the original function, which is why x equals negative 2 is one of its roots. Now, at this point in time, do I keep testing? Should I keep going? Should I keep on testing roots? Because I can keep testing in this table. Or I can make a subtable. I can make a subtable and try other numbers as well. What do you think? Yeah, so what would that equation look like? Go ahead, tell me. So we bring these down, and they usually become the next table. And I'm going to put a little cross to that. Make that table. We bring down those values, and they usually become the headings of the next table. Okay. But if they're squared, what can I use to solve that? How can I solve this? I either one of three methods. Three methods. What are they? You plug out the formula factor. Yeah, complete square factor or quadratic formula. So remember, normally your reduced, or we call it depressed, the next level, right? From one level to the next, and the depressed level. The depressed or reduced equation 
usually becomes the heading for my next, <coughs> God bless you, for my next sub table. But because it's quadratic, we can solve quadratics with either factoring, completing the square, or quadratic formula. What kind of roots am I going to get from this one? I'm going to use quadratic formula. I've got negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. So I'm going to get 4 minus 20 in the radical. So what kind of a number is this going to be, Seb? Yeah. This becomes a negative number, which makes my roots, the other two, imaginary. How do I know there's two of them? Why did I, why did I say two? Why did I say just one imaginary? Why do I know there's two, Christian? It's going to be plus or minus. Yeah. Remember, your answer is plus or minus, and this is going to be imaginary at the end. So you have plus i and minus i. Both of those roots are imaginary. Remember, imaginary roots come in pairs. Very good. Just like irrational roots. Just like, as Valentina told us, binomial conjugates that we're going to use, which is right. 2 plus root 3. If 2 plus root 3 is a root, 2 minus root 3 is going to be a root. And you're going to get them in pairs. The imaginary and the irrational roots, you'll get them in pairs. For, for, for the most part, I should say. Should, all things, actually. Imaginary for sure. Rational, I feel like you can get those by themselves also. With other examples. Don't you also know how many roots you have by the three? Yeah, you absolutely do. Well, you know that you have three total, right? And here's one of them that we solved for, which was negative two. And the other two roots make up the total of three. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay, so if I have x to the fourth, I'm going to have four roots. And my next equation become x to the third, so I'll be the subtable. And then the subtable of x to the third becomes x squared. And for that one, I can go ahead and use my quadratic formula. Okay, so I keep going to subtables every time until I get down to x squared. In this kind of problem, are you just trying to find how many you have, or are you actually like, asking for the roots? You're actually asking for the roots. So you would continue with or yeah. just solve this and get the other two roots. I was saying, but I just said, oh, wait, no, no, no. So if you have, like, because you would take out the i. Right. Let's finish it so you can see it. Good. Yeah, you so would. it would be 2 plus or minus 4i over 2. And then um, and over 2. Uh, could you like um, cancel out the 2? Because it's on those. 4i, uh, because you have negative 16 under here. Okay, good. So you did your extra step. So 2 plus or minus 4i over 2, right? That's where you're at? So whenever I have a monomial divided into a multiple term, Polynomial, it divides into everything, remember, everything. So, so you get 1 plus 2 over plus or minus 2 over Yep. And those are your other two roots. So here's your three roots all together. 1 plus or minus, whoops, plus or minus 2i, and then negative 2. Now, Eduardo, I have a question to you, to follow up your question. If I asked you, instead of finding the roots, I didn't say find the roots of the equation. Or I didn't say find the zeros of the function. If I said find the x-intercepts, x-intercepts, how could you treat this differently? Um, oh, well, you would make the equation equal to zero, like x cubed, and then, um... Okay, which is what we did, yep. You would, um... It's a simpler question than you think of, so somebody help them out. X-intercepts, what about them do we know? Can they be, or can they not be? So if a problem says find the x-intercepts on the graph physically, right, you can't have imaginary x-intercepts. You can call them roots. You can call these the zeros of the function because they would make the function equal zero. But they will not show up on the graph as x-intercepts. So for a problem that asks for x-intercepts, as soon as you recognize that this is going to be negative and you're going to get imaginary, you could stop there. And this would be your only answer. There's only one x-intercept. The other two intercepts do not appear because those roots or those zeros are imaginary. Zeros of a function, roots of an equation, they can be imaginary, but x-intercepts, we don't miss imaginary in this situation. The x-intercept will only be negative 2 here. Can you ask a question? No? I think I had a hand. So negative 2, that's the root, and then x plus 2 is the factor? Correct. And look at the graph. Look at the graph at the top right. The root of negative 2, isn't that the x-intercept up here? 
That's where that corresponds. And as a result, this thing would factor into x plus 2 times x squared minus 2x plus 5, right? Whatever's left over, which is this right here. This thing times x plus 2 from here would get you back to up here, actually. It's the remainder in fact. Definitely a question for the test. Absolutely a question for like a long answer, and absolutely a question for a multiple choice and short answer. Because you can ask these questions so many ways. I can simply give you a function and say, is four a factor, or is four a root of this equation? Or is x minus one a factor of this equation? And then you can just look for the remainder itself, right? You can see if the remainder itself actually is equal to zero or not. Test. So that could be a multiple choice or a short answer easily. Not just a long answer problem like this. So the coefficients on the is going to be the problem. The exponent. Yes. The highest exponent. It's the highest degree. Of the and the degree of the polynomial, which is 3 in this case, always gives you the total number of roots or zeros. Remember, there's 1, 2, 3 of them. Not technically x intercepts, right? Because there's only one x intercept in this problem. It can tell you the most amount of x intercepts you could have. Three is the most you could have, but we only have one here. Because the other two are matching. Isabella, great three questions so far. Somebody else with questions. I'm glad that she's asking questions, but I want to take other areas that you have concerns in. Yeah. You got to be more specific though, because I did it today, me and you, but I can't go over the whole topic of logs right now. What kind of a problem would you want to do? So a word problem is what you're asking? Okay, so let's look at a word problem from locks. So we're looking in the text at this point in like section, I think it was like 10.7, 10.6, 10.7, right in there or something, right? Okay, here we go. So again, these are either monetary growth problems with compounded interest or they're exponential growth or decay. So we have only two formulas that we've worked with, yeah. They're not. They're not going to be given on the test. I've never given equations for this. Okay, 1 plus or minus r over n to the nt. And then the other one is this. Oops. There we go. Okay. No, because for that top problem, we only look at interest accrued. Technically, it could be negative, yeah, if you wanted to think about it. But those problems are never going to be asked where you have a negative interest rate because you wouldn't, you wouldn't invest in a loan that was a negative interest rate. You know? Or you wouldn't invest in something that had a negative interest rate. That'd be a loan, really, is what you'd be doing then. Uh, so it depends on the problem what we're going to do. So let's look at an example that is not a money problem because I think most of you are pretty good at the money problems. You have more struggles with the other ones. So let's say... I mean, it could be asked any way. Do you want to solve for x? Do you want to solve for r? Do you want to solve for a or solve for y? Right? You see what I'm saying? So it depends on the problem context. So I'll pick one randomly. I don't know what specifically, Regina, which one you'd like to try. But an example in here says something like, 10 years ago, Michael paid $250 for a rare stamp. But currently, it's worth $1,000. Find the average annual rate of growth. Okay, 10 years ago. It went from 250 to 1000 Now. We cannot assume linear growth. That's a mistake that a couple of them made on the last test. This is exponential growth. So I can't say, oh, you know what? It took him 10 years, and he made 750 bucks, so $75 per year. And that's logical to say that if it were linear growth, but it's not linear growth. It's not linear growth, okay? So we're looking at the average annual rate of appreciation is what we're trying to figure out, or rate of growth. So 250 is what the value started at when this guy bought it. So what does that go? In this case, we're on the second formula, right? Okay. We know that currently, today, it's worth $1,000. Where does that go for these problems? Why? Now, the question says, find the average annual rate of growth. So what are we looking for? The rate, so what variable? R. R, careful. So we have R we're looking for. What is X though, is the question. This is the part that most people confuse. Is there like a number by time intervals that 
Good. I like the way you word it. Time intervals is the key. It's not years. It's not months. It depends on the problem. Now, if I look at the rate, we are looking for the rate. It says, sorry, find the average annual rate of growth. Annual, annual, annual represents. What does annual mean? Oh, it's like per year. Per year. So what is my unit of time in this problem then? What is my unit of time? One. Not one. One can't be a unit. You just said it. It's per. per year. So what's my unit of time? Oh, years. Years. Oh, so you what? Number. Sorry. Whatever the rate is per is the unit. So like if I said find the rate of growth per month, find the rate of growth per hour. Your test, you have one on hours, right? Because the bacteria growth was from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. So what changed there? Hours changed. Here, this person, Joe Schmo, bought this stamp, and then 10 years later, we have a value. So they tell you it's 10 years later. So x is 10. Because we're looking for r in terms of rate per year. Rate per year. Yes, all this is in the textbook. This is problem number 18 on page 488. So again, we're looking for the annual rate of increase. Now, it says that it's increasing. You know that it's increasing because you're going from 250 to 1,000. So am I going to put 1 plus or minus R, really? What am I going to put? Plus, because it's increasing. Okay, so get rid of that minus sign because of the context of the problem. Remember, this is a decision-making process you take and use. You have to recognize it is growth or decay. It is growth, it's plus, it is decay, it's and then we solve this for R. This is not a hard problem to solve for R. And you will definitely have a calculator. So you don't even have to do the math behind this. You don't even need logs. Why do I need logs here? Why do I not need logs? Why do I know I don't need logs? There's no what, Christian? There's no variable in the exponent. Good. No exponent with a variable. Very good. No variable in the exponent. I always confuse those again. That's the guidance. You're right. There's no variable in the exponent. Since there's no variable up here, I'm not looking at logs. When it's here, divide by 250, you get 4. 4 equals this. How do you get rid of the 10th power? Raise it to the 1 10th one power on both sides. So this would become 4 equals. You can come after school. We can continue this. Okay, but this is what it becomes, which on the next line, just raise both sides to the 1 10th power. And 10th to the 1 10th cancels. Okay, tenth to the one tenth cancels. What is four to the one tenth power? Do it in your calculator. Take that number and subtract one from it and get R by itself. Please come after school today, please. Well, even though we're not seeing this in the video. <clears throat> uh, we quickly talked about solving equations and a method of solving equations that might be a little bit, this is not working, is it? that might be a little bit easier for us to adopt if it's a multiple choice question, right? So if it's a question that involves work, obviously do all the work by hand. So you're on a multiple choice question and you're trying to figure out the solution to it. And it's an equation, it can be anything. So let's start with an equation that says the following. Let's do 2x plus 7 uh, minus log of x equals x squared, negative x squared, plus 8. Let's do something like that, okay? Now, solving this by hand would be way more complicated than it seems. At first, you're like, oh, well, it's a quadratic. I can move everything over, but then you have the log function in the quadratic, right? So you can sit here and manipulate this and try to solve it and get as close as possible where you get a quadratic equals log x. And at that point, you could say, okay, 10 to the quadratic equals x, but then it's just going to get really messy converting back to exponential. So this is an example where you would probably not want to do it by hand, even though if you really pushed yourself, you probably could eventually get the answer. So let's use this as our example of the calculator. So in y1, let's type in what we see on the left-hand side of the equation. So again, this goes in y1, and this goes in y2. Up to y1, clear it. In y1, again, we've got 2x plus oops, 2x 
plus 7 minus log x. Huh? The problem is that there's a log x in here, right? So if it was a quadratic, you can move it over, set it equal to 0, and then either factor, quadratic formula, or completing the square. The fact is that we have log x in the actual equation. So if I move everything over and set it equal to 0, I can't factor the log x. So I'd have to actually move everything over and get log x by itself, and then convert to exponential form. And you'd have 10 to the power of whatever this is equals x. And that would just be a really tough problem to solve by hand. Out. Wait, so you can, you can just set those equal to each other? I mean, when they're equal to each other, you can just put one in my one. The idea is this. When equations, or when expressions, rather, equal each other, you have an equation. So one side is the first expression over here, and this is the second expression. And the reason we set them equal is because we're trying to figure out when they have the same value. For them to have the same value, it means they're going to cross at the same spot on the actual graph. So where they cross or where they have an intersection, the same value, that x-coordinate is what would go in for these to give you that same value. So let's say our answer is 2. It's not. Let's say our answer is 2. It means that if I put a 2 in here and a 2 in these spots, I'm going to get some number here equals the same number over here. That's why they intersect, because the y values are the same when they intersect. So in y1, we've got the first piece. In y2 now, we're going to plug in the negative. So make sure you use the negative symbol right at the bottom here. Negative x squared, and that's going to be plus 8. I picked these. Hopefully, they do intersect. Hopefully, they do. Let's hit zoom 6. The reason I had zoom 6 is the first look at my standard graph from negative 10 to 10. Ooh, they kind of intersect, almost. Let's make it instead of plus, what do I make it? Plus 8. Let's make it plus 12. Make the equation for y2 plus 12. What is that going to do to my graph? It's going to raise it up four units. Take a look at my graph. It looks like the parabola almost intersects, right? You see it? The parabola is there. If I took that parabola, though, and slid the parabola up a little bit, it would intersect with that line on the right side. So I'm going to change my equation just for the sake of this problem. And y2 to make this negative x squared plus 12 instead. And I'm going to graph that. Now. I'm going to have a problem finding the intersection because it's probably off the graph, and it looks like it pretty much is. So I need to go further up on my y-axis. So I'm going to go to my window settings now to change that. Again, very useful techniques for the final. We've talked about a couple of these. We've talked about window settings before. It's the same as earlier. If you hit the word window here, hit the button window, you're going to see that your x max and your y max are both 10, and your x min and your y min are both negative 10. That's the standard graph. That's what zoom 6 does. But I don't want to use zoom 6 now. I want to extend my graph a little bit further on the y-axis. So what am I going to change here? What will I change? Y-min and y-max. Yeah. So y-min, it doesn't matter as much because it's low, but y-max for sure. Well, give me a number we can go up to instead of 10. Yeah. Let's try 15. And then hit graph. If you hit zoom 6, it'll reset it back to 10. You only hit zoom 6 the first time you graph, so it restores your graph to negative 10 to 10. But if you don't want to go from negative 10 to 10 and negative 10 to 10, and you want to get up to like 15 or 20 on the y scale, you got to hit the window and then hit graph. Do not hit zoom 6 again, or it'll start back over. And now we can see how many intersections are there. In this graph, how many intersections are there? Only one. Why do you think that is? I thought quadratics always have two answers, we said. Right? We talked about that. Quadratics, they should always have two answers. Isn't it the most number? Like the the degree of the exponent, I mean the degree of the... And, and the degree is 2 here, yeah. x squared. Yeah, but isn't like, so choose the most number of intersections you can have? Correct, but why doesn't it have the other one? You're right, it is the most. It's usually, in, in, in terms of quadratics, it usually is 2, right? But it is the most amount, so it doesn't have to be 2, it can be less than 2. Why in this case is it not 2? It may be, but there's probably a better reason. I don't, I don't know the answer, so that's a possibility. The other word could be imaginary, but usually imaginary come in pairs. So you'd be missing two roots, not one, right? Come on, what do we add to this function that we haven't used until just recently in the year? Logs. What do we know about logs? What do we know about logs? Their arguments can't be what? Negative. Negative. So notice the graph of this doesn't continue, right? The other intersection would be on this side. The fact that we introduced the log function altered y1. Go back to y1. If it was just 2x plus 7, then that's fine. 
it would be a line, and it would probably intersect the parabola, right? Here's a parabola. A line intersects twice, or if it's tangent at the peak, once, or if the line is up here, it never intersects the parabola. So zero, one, or two. Double root, imaginary roots when it's not intersecting, and then two real roots when it intersects. But here we have the log function in play. X cannot be negative if the argument of log is X. We can't do log of negative three, we can't do log of negative two. So look at your graph. Y1, and I'm gonna change this, watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make Y1 a little bit thicker as a line. So when I graph it, I can see which one Y1 is. So Y1 will be this thicker curve you see right there. And then there's Y2, the parabola. So Y1 does not exist to the left of the Y axis because X must be greater than or equal to zero for log functions. The argument itself must be greater than or equal to zero. So there's one intersection, so there's therefore only one solution. How do I find that intersection? What do I press? What do I press? Isabella? I'm second trace and then intersection. All right, so let's do it slower. You're right, second trace. Second trace, continue. And then I press five. Then just press the number five. Don't go down, right? Just press the number five, it works. Continue. And then I chose negative five. Oh, wait, And then for the first curve, I did negative five. I so did you just type numbers for this? Well, I like, did the arrow thing, but like, I just realized I could have just pressed Yeah, so you can type the number or you can do what I'm doing. Look, left and right moves your arrow along, moves the cursor. And it's just saying this. Where is the intersection? Because there could be how many intersections? Many, multiple. So if you don't need to calculate an idea of where to search, then I can know which one to find. So by moving my cursor over to the intersection, it knows I'm choosing that. If there's only one intersection, it doesn't matter what you press. Just press enter, enter, enter. If there's only one intersection, just press enter, enter, enter. Because it's automatically going to find that intersection. But if there are multiple intersections, you need to do what Isabella said, which is type in a guesstimate for the x, or just use the cursor, and use the left and right arrows to move the cursor over. But so when you type in for first curve, that's like the first intersection, then if you do another one, then yeah, but second, but what do you put for guess? Just hit enter. As long as you put the first two close to where the intersection is, see, see where the cursor is right now? And I'm on the second one, it's still close. And then guess, see where the cursor is? It's pretty much there, right? So hit enter and it will definitely find it. The problem is this. When you have graphs like sine waves, they do this. So there are infinite intersections between a sine wave and a horizontal line. So you can have a problem where x, a y1 and y2 intersect infinitely many times. That's why you need to give it a search domain, a region that you're going to search inside of. Okay? Second calculator thing to help, finding roots of a quadratic or any polynomial. So let's go to our y equals, please, together. Go to y equals, clear it out, clear out the first two. Let's type in this function, x to the fourth plus, I'm hoping it works, if not, I'll, I'll adjust a little bit, plus two x squared plus x minus eight. And I'm picking arbitrary values right now. The only thing I picked with specific, with specific meaning was the negative eight. Why did I choose negative eight, not positive eight? The y intercept, good. So I want it to intersect down here on the y axis because this graph opens. Which way does this graph open? Upward. It opens up. Remember, x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, they all follow the same trend. They all open up. So because I knew it was going to open up and I wanted to cross the x axis to get x intercepts, I chose negative 8 as my y intercept here. Okay? That's the reason I did that. No, I was going to ask, this is minus 8. Yeah, that, that's why I put the minus 8 there, the negative 8. I had to use that. Because if I used positive 8, it would have started at positive 8 and probably opened up, and you would never intersect the x-axis. When you think about the x-axis down here, positive 8 is up here. Let's take a look at this graph. Let's do zoom 6. I use zoom 6 every time. I know it's annoying that I say that, but just because I get a full picture from negative 10 to 10. And if it doesn't show up, it doesn't mean the graph doesn't exist. It means you need to zoom out a little bit, or change your window settings to go from maybe negative 20 to 20 or negative 30 to 30, et cetera, et cetera, right? You have to zoom out a little bit. How many intersections or how many, how many intersects do we see? X intercepts do we see? Two. But it said X to the fourth, and there's only two. There should be four answers to this, because it's X to the fourth. Four answers, X to the fourth. What's the deal? What's the deal? You gave me some solutions earlier. 
Yeah. We're missing two, aren't we? Whenever you're missing two intercepts, those are imaginary. Or four, or six, or eight. But if you're missing one, it's not imaginary. Because imaginary rooms come in pairs. They come in pairs. So, if I am doing this problem, right? Let's go, let's go back to the actual equation, please. So let's say this is a part two, or a part three, rather. And you have to find the x-intercepts using synthetic division. This is what you should do. And then you get an idea of where your x-intercepts are by looking at the graph. By looking at the graph. Or maybe it's a multiple choice. Maybe it's a multiple choice. You just got to graph this and then find the intercepts. But how do we find those intercepts? How do we do that? Who remembers how to find intercepts? Go ahead. So same command as before for intersect, right? Second, count, or trace. Either way, more you want to think about. Go ahead. Good. So this is the zero of the function. The word root or x-intercept or solution is not what shows up in this category. The word zero, you want the zero of the function. So choose the number two. Now, Helen, what's this deal with left bound and right bound? Yeah, very good. So if I want to find the left x-intercept, what is that between? What integer values is the left x-intercept between? What two integer values, set? Negative two and negative one. Negative two and negative one. So to the left of this number is negative two. To the left of the intercept is negative two. To the right is negative one. So for the left bound, I can actually just type in the number negative two. Make sure you don't press minus two, use negative. Negative. So that's fine. Start over. Just press second, trace one more time, and choose option number two again. And when it says left down question mark, don't start tracing. Just type in the number negative two right away. See? There you go. So it'll show up like this. Instead, instead of tracing, if you start tracing, then it's not going to work, I don't think. And then it's going to say right bound. And I want to choose negative one. Negative one. Then it says guess. As long as your bounds are good, your answer will work. The guess means nothing. If you say it's between negative two and negative one, it will find the root between those, guaranteed. But if you pick a range that has two roots between it, then which root is it gonna find? You don't know, based on your guess. So I make sure to choose the correct bounds. Hit enter one more time, and there's my answer for the left root. Around negative 1.5. Around negative 1.5. You're gonna do the same process. Let's do it together. I'll do it quicker this time. Second, trace. Again, choose the number two for the zero of the function. Now for a left bound, I'll choose zero. I can't really see, this is really blurry. It might be on one, right? It's too close to call. So I'm gonna choose zero as my left bound, and then another like five as my right bound, just to prove to you guys that my search domain just has to be on the outside of the root. It doesn't matter how far you go, as long as you don't have two roots in between. So I'm going to press 0 for the left bound and 5 for the right bound. Now I want you to notice, look at the arrows. It's going to search between 0 and 5. That's what the arrows are showing up as. So the calculator will now search between 0 and 5 to find the only root, and there's only one there, so just hit enter. And it's right around 1, 1.33, 1 and a third approximately. Okay, approximately. So a good technique for finding your intercepts. Now why is this useful? Because you can do this also with any equation if you set the equation equal to zero. Remember how the last example, let's go back to the iPad. Remember this example here? I could have done what Helen said. Helen said, why don't we just set this equal to zero and solve? Well, we couldn't do it algebraically, right? You can't solve this one by hand. But we could have, Helen, like you said, move this whole thing over, have this equal to zero, and then find the x-intercepts. And it would be the exact same answer as finding the intersection of these two curves. Again. I can set the function equal to zero and then find the x-intercepts. Because what is the y value of an x-intercept? The y value is always zero when you find the x-intercept. So if you can move this whole thing over, you can just find the x-intercepts and that would be the solution to the equation as well. Um, I'm trying to think calculator-wise. Other stuff that you want to practice, other things that we could go through. Ooh, maxes and mins. If you want to find the maximum area in a problem, or if you want to find the minimum cost, you did that by finding the axis of symmetry first, and then you found the vertex. And you can do that all algebraically. Axis of symmetry is negative b over 2a. 
You plug that in to get the vertex value, that'll give you the minimum, or it'll give you the maximum. How do we check that on a calculator? How do I find the minimum of this, oops, of this function that we're using here? Let's use this one as an example. How do I find the minimum of any, any function, really? You can help the last calculator. Who hasn't dealt with the calculator and knows how to do this and wants to help out? Seb, you got this one? Go ahead. You can use a table, but that's not direct. It'll work. You can look for when it starts to change, when it goes to like more and more negative, and then it starts to become more and more positive. So a table would give you an estimate set. It would give you an estimate. You, you know what to do? Yeah, so we're looking for the maximum. Yeah. In this case, the minimum, the maximum. But in this case, minimum. So second command, same command, second trace or second count. Exactly. When we're looking for a minimum, so we choose the number three here. We choose the number three. And again, it says left bound. So pick a number to the left of the vertex. So let's say negative two. Where do you guys think the vertex is, if you were to estimate it? On the x, on the x-axis, where is the vertex? Or where is, I'm really asking you, where is the axis of symmetry? That's what I'm really asking right now. Approximately, where is it? I see it right here, right? Where is that along x, Eduardo? What do you think? It's like probably just to the left of the y-axis, or maybe even the y-axis. Yeah, it's somewhere just to the left of the y-axis. We don't know for sure, right? It's a tough one to see. So if I'm going to search for the only minimum on the graph, there's only one minimum, and there it is, I can choose negative 3 and positive 3 as my bounds, or negative 5 and positive 5, because it's going to find it guaranteed. But I don't want to choose any numbers beyond my graph. So don't choose numbers beyond negative 10 or 10. It's not going to work. So I'm going to choose negative 5 as the left bound, 5 as the right bound, and look at my arrows again. Is there a minimum between the arrows? Absolutely. And there's only one of them, right? So it will guarantee find it. Just hit enter. Just hit enter. Okay, it will give you the minimum value. So its location is negative, two, uh, negative 0.23, but the value itself is negative 8.1. The location is the x part, the value is the y part. Okay, remember that. Now this is not axis symmetry, by the way. I, I misspoke there, because it's not a quadratic. There isn't an axis symmetry here. Okay, only axis symmetry exists when you have even functions. This is not an even function. <coughs> God bless you. Let me think of anything else in these commands that I want to go through. Set up. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, I, I know it's warm, so it's very easy to yawn and feel tired. If you need to get up and get water, just do it quietly. You don't have to ask, okay? So if you need to wake yourself up a little bit to get water, that's okay. Because it, when it's warm, I know people yawn a lot. I've seen like four of you yawn already. It's okay. So I don't get water, I don't mind. I, I'm, I'm the same way, trust me. And people always look at you like, oh my God, you're tired, you're not listening? It's like, no, you're just lying, I get it. Is there a way to do like synthetic division or long division with polynomials on the calculator? What you could do, if you want to, is you could just put the function in and go to your table and see what you get out. So if I type in like four, six, eight, negative two, oops. Negative two. That's synthetic division, really, right? Synthetic substitution, when you plug into the synthetic table, it gives you a remainder. Isn't the remainder the y value? So this is really doing just that. So the remainder that you get is the y the one value. So if you plug one into the synthetic table for this function, you'll get 284. I'm oh, sorry, if you plug four in in the synthetic table for this function, you'll get out 284 as the remainder. So you could use the calculator to check your remainder, absolutely. That's a great technique. Remember, synthetic substitution in the table is the same thing as direct substitution when you plug this number directly into the function, which is what the table is doing for you here. Can you repeat that? Which part? Like, I, I know you type in, and then I don't know. Okay, so when you, when you synthetically evaluate something, remember, what happens is it looks like this. So say the function is whatever it is, y equals whatever. Right, here's the table, here's some numbers along the top. You plug in a 2. What comes out here is the y value. Remember, this is the x value. The remainder is the y value. So instead of doing a synthetic table over, and you're going to probably have to do this, by the way, on part 2, on part 3. So you shouldn't just assume the calculator will help you. But on part 1, if it says something like, what is the remainder when you plug this into the function, instead of running through the table and doing all this work, you can go to your calculator. You can plug the function in y1 and just type in 2 here, 
and see what the y value is. And that will give me the remainder of 18, which is the same thing I would get if I plug 2 in and get it out of the table here. Okay, so it's x comma y always. The remainder is the y value, and that's what we're seeing in this table. How did I get it so that I can choose x here? Anybody know that one? Like, I'm allowed to type x in. Some of your calculators probably have things already there. How can I get it so I can choose x? Valentina, what do you see for that? Did you have your hand up? Uh, no, my hand, no. I just don't. Uh, I'm going to go to, like, table set. Very good. Table settings, which is second, and then hit window. Go ahead. And then, like, for the independent dependent, you say ask, or is it auto? Yeah, the independent variable is x. You want to ask the calculator the x value and let it automatically calculate the y value. So it's x comma y, right? Independent, dependent is x comma y. So if you set your table up like this, and you go over to your table, it will give you the option. Now, if, you have, if you've used all these spaces, just press delete. Okay, and you can type in whatever you want here. But just make sure if you use this, look, if I press minus two and hit enter, syntax error. When you get a syntax error, don't hit quit, hit go to. Remember, did I tell you guys that? When I was in high school, I used to think it was Gato. I'm like, what is this Gato thing? It means go to the error. I never knew that. I really swear to God I didn't know that. It, it brings you right to the error. So press the number two and look where it brings me. It's telling me there's something wrong with the sign. And I can't use a minus sign. I have to use a negative sign when I enter in numbers. And you put this into y1, right? Yes, very good. y1 is where the function goes. And now when I hit enter, I get a value. Okay, this goes right into y1. Just like you would put it across the top of your synthetic table as coefficients, you put it into y1. Should we, can we the matrix? Sure. On the calculator? Yeah. yeah, let's do that. So let's enter a matrix. Let's go to, this is a great lesson, guys, because I think this will probably help a lot on the test. Your theory is there and practicing is there, but checking things, especially on a test when you can use a calculator the whole way, right, is good to know how to use that. So let's look at an example of this. Let's say it's 2x plus 3y minus z equals 8, 4x plus 2z minus y equals 7, and 2z plus y equals 4 minus 3x. So there's my three equations I have to solve. I'm just going to plug them right into the matrix, right? Just like this, plug it right in. Why are you shaking your head no right away? We got it. We do what? Move the 3x over, and what else? Something else I have to do. You're on the right track. He's halfway there. Help him out, Regina. Remember, the variables have to line up. X first, then Y, then Z. Or as long as they're consistent, it doesn't matter which way you do it. So the first equation is good. Leave it alone. And I'll use that as my model for the rest. Whatever the first one gives you, use as your model. But remember that your constant is always alone by itself on the right-hand side. So what does that second equation become? Second equation, what do I have to write it as to be careful here? 4X minus Y plus 2Z equals 7. Yeah, so pretty much... Mix up your y and z, switch them around because they're mixed up in this problem. And then as Alex said, for the last one, Alex, we move the 3x over, becomes a positive 3x, and then I have a positive 2z, and then I have a positive y, and that equals all four. So again, what did I do here? I moved the 3x over and switched the order of these two, put them in that order. So now it's x, y, z, constants. So when I use the matrix to operate on this, I'm going to get an answer out. So my matrix, let's go one step at a time. My matrix for this is just my coefficients. What if I'm missing something? What goes in its place if it's not there? If it's not there, what goes in its place? Oh, zero. zero. Remember, if the variable is there, the coefficient is a one. Yeah. Right? But if it's not there, the coefficient is, act is technically zero. So that's my matrix. And now I need to operate on that matrix using my calculator command RREF of that matrix. My answer will be something like this. Okay? And I'll get three numbers on the end. These numbers will be X, Y, and Z in order. In the order you read them from left to right, take a look here. X, Y, Z from left to right is the same order from top to bottom your answers will display. So I'm going to go back to the calculator now on the computer. Okay, for those that are confused about this or haven't done it in a while, I press second, and then I press the X to the negative one button, which brings up a matrix. Yeah, you get to the R. Okay. 
Give me one step at a time. I gotta get there, so I'm plugged it in. Uh, it's probably under your math command here, okay? Go over to edit. I know it's a three by four matrix, but if I didn't know that, it's always rows by columns, rows by columns. How many rows are there? Three. How many columns? Four. So I choose three by four. If it was only X and Y, it would be that. It'd be a two by three matrix. But we have X, Y, Z, so it's three by four. So my numbers are the following. I've got two, enter, three, enter, negative one, enter, eight, enter, four, enter, negative one, enter, two, enter, seven, and then finally three, one, two, four. So I've entered everything into my matrix at this point. Yes, Ed. Wait, uh, what, what do you do when you get to edit? So you go, you got into matrix, right? Yeah. Second matrix, you go over to edit, hit enter on matrix A, yeah. and then make this a three by four matrix before you start entering your numbers. Once you've done that, enter all the numbers as coefficients we just drew on the table. For those that are waiting, go to our, our go to the home screen, try to have completely go to your home screen, and go back to matrix, go over to math, go down to R R E F and then call out matrix A by going back into matrix one last time. Is everybody at the point here? Eduardo, you caught up? You good? Uh, yeah. I don't want to leave, I don't want to lose you behind, that's why. Yeah, I put in the You have it in? Yeah. Okay, so at this point, everybody press second quit, go to your home screen, go back into matrix, let's go over to math, let's go down to R, R, E, F, and now the key here is to call out matrix A, but not under edit. Go back to matrix and just hit enter here. You're not gonna do it editing. Now, it might not give an answer. It's possible that these three, these are surfaces actually, they're surfaces. It's possible they don't intersect. Let's take a look, they do. Now, if I wanted those answers as fractions, they're all decimals, what do I press? Math. Math, and then the first thing, so enter, enter. And look at that. Those are my answers right there. So x is 61 21sts, y is negative 1 21st, and z is negative 7 thirds. Negative 7 thirds. And the decimals are above. Yes? Are you to fraction? Math. Excuse me. Math. Enter. Enter. And if you want to convert to decimal from fraction, press math and then the number 2. See the converting arrow there? Do you care what you have in? No, I mean, if, if the test is multiple choice and the answer is written as fraction, then you need fraction, right? But if you're solving an answer and you're solving something on a part two, a decimal or a fraction is fine. If it says rounding there's tenths, just follow the rounding directions. Yeah? I got a slightly different answer. That means your matrix you entered is not correct. Go back to your original matrix. So press ready, press second matrix, go over to edit, and find the mistake. That means you have a mistake in there somewhere. You I probably looked, just. I looked for it, but I don't see it. Read your numbers, go. Good. No, negative one. There you go. <laughs> okay, sorry, the original. Here's the original. I'll put it back up. It was a negative one. Here. I think you probably saw this as, oh, a, as a two C instead of a C. C. Yep. But that's fine. When you, when you see that and you notice it's off by a little bit, that's the reason why. And now you can just press second enter to recall the previous. Do you guys know that one, that little trick? So if you went into your matrix, take a look at what I'm going to do. Let's say I went in and made a quick command, a quick edit. I don't want to redo all this. I can press second enter, second enter. Enter, and it'll bring up the previous commands I operated on. So I can do this again and redo it. So you don't have to go back into matrix and do that again. Just press second enter, second enter, and it'll bring up the previous commands you operated. It's just a shortcut of the calculator. Uh, yes, okay. On the while ago, we made this program like. Quadratic, quadratic formula. formula. Yeah. yeah. Should we keep that on? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Listen, if it's a part two, you need to show work, but you can check it on there, can't you? The quadratic formula does not give you one. It gives you the roots, it doesn't give you the factors. Keep that in mind. Just so when you're asked for factors, it could be, but if a root is one half, it means the factor was probably 2x minus 1, or 4x minus 2, or 6x minus 3. Any of those give a root of one half, don't they? So the roots don't actually give you the exact factors. Keep that in mind. So especially with AC method problems. Okay, keep that in mind. You can check your roots with the quadratic formula, but you want to be able to do it by hand, either by factoring 
quadratic formula or completing the square. Right? One of those three methods. Other stuff on the calculus. This is great that you asked about the matrix. I forgot about that completely. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. Guys, definitely we'll have a system of equations somewhere on the test. So if it's multiple choice, are you going to do this by hand? No. If it's two variables, two equations, go right into your matrix, make it a two by three, and just type in the coefficients. Make sure they're in order, hit enter, let your calculator do the work for you. I mean, if you're really good at it, and you notice that you can just add straight down and things cancel, by all means, use elimination. But substitution always takes a little while. It's not worth it, and there's room for error, right? And you guys are smart. You're probably gonna finish this test. You have two and a half hours, it's not hours test. But you're probably gonna finish with like 15 or 20 minutes to spare, at least test. You, you probably will. Okay, it's not three full tests and you're getting a time of three full tests. So think about it that way. So my guess is that, you know what, if you don't want to do that now, put a little star or circle things that you want to check on the calculator later. Maybe star things that you want to go back and look at independently or mathematically. Right? Make a coding system for yourself so that you're efficient when you're taking the test. Calculator stuff. Anything else I'm trying to forget or that I'm forgetting? Domain and range? You can do in the calculator. Let's talk about that real quick. So I've given you a lot of problems that say things like this. Restricted domain of the following function. And you know what? You have to realize that, oh, you can't have a negative under here. So it's 2x plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Solve this. x is greater than or equal to negative 1 half. Yeah, there's my domain. But let's say you hypothetically forget how to do domain or how to figure out the domain of a problem with a fraction. Remember, the denominator can't have 0 in it, right? So you forget how to do the domain for this problem. So go ahead and just graph it in y1. It's radical 2x plus 1. Let's go back to our calculator. Let's go to y1, clear it out. Second square root. And we want 2x plus 1 in there. Moral. Um, it has to be greater than 0 or? Greater than or equal to 0 for, an abs for a radical function in the numerator, moral. But if the radical is in the denominator, it can't be equal to zero, because the denominator can't have zero. When I press zoom six, when I press zoom six, where does the graph start from? It starts from negative one half. And if you can't see that, zoom in enough to see. Or you can go to your table and test numbers to see which ones work. So if I go to my table and type in negative two, is it gonna give me an answer? Or negative three? No, I'm gonna get an error, because the domain does not exist for that value. Yeah, you can trace over, you can trace over. Remember, guys, it's not after school today. I'm basically meeting for about an hour and a half. If you're around, it's the only reason I will tell you my course for you to come by. Okay? I'm not in school on Tuesday. Teachers are not in every day. So I know you have exams on Tuesday. I'm probably not. I mean, if I happen to be up there, I'll email you. But if you guys want to meet and do a little review on Tuesday for Wednesday's exam, that's fine. Do you have morning or afternoon exams on Tuesday? Does everybody have afternoon at least? Yeah. So if you want me, I'll consider it. If enough people want to, maybe you guys can email me with some interest, and I can come in Tuesday afternoon if you want to. But I want to hear from you guys if you want me to be here. I'm not just going to come in for no one. Okay, so if people actually are going to be here on Tuesday and are committed to coming in, I'm happy to come in after the second exam on Tuesday. Okay, think about it. Talk to each other and email me if you want to. Okay? I had a great year, guys. I really did. I hope I have you again. I really do. I hope I have all of you again. It would be really my pleasure. Okay? So please, try to have my class later on. I'm happy to do it. I mean, I would guess it would go that long at most. Now, we want to talk with each of you guys individually. So it depends on when we talk. So we're going to talk to the team as a whole, and then we're going to bring each of you guys individually. What's up? How are you? Oh, it's great to see you again. So, so it would be something like that. Between an hour and an hour and a half. Hey, what's up? How's it going? Zane, everybody doing I like you. I'm about to put it on team. You're about to put it on team. What's up, man? It's nice. How are you?
she's one of our four hundred for sure. What's that again? No, what? What are you studying? Hey, yeah, you're studying engineering, right? Yeah. yeah. What are you studying? Uh, I'm studying international politics. Okay. How's that? Yeah. Well, so you just taking introductory yeah. courses. That's about that. Okay. Yeah. Next year, she can have a Pre-reps, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. And you got to be a tech man. So I am planning on doing my key with a minor in applied math, so I'm ready to do like a class with a minor in math. What? Thank you. Minor in math? Really? Not that it was an applied math, but okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. That's the exact same thing. A lot of courses are applied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I actually. And the math courses are like actually a lot more sometimes. Like, yeah, I did a lot of high math, which helped me in engineering, like, for sure. Yeah. I, I understand how things work and stuff. Mm -hmm. I took, um, I was able to. There's some really cool math classes. Yeah, they are. And they don't always, you know, offer that in just engineering courses, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So I remember one of my favorites was uh, was a numerical analysis course. We learned everything about like how certain functions work like on the calculator. Like you graph in that thing, like those kind of things, or cubic splines and fitting curves and interpolation, all by hand, because it was math class. But we learned about it in engineering and applying it, how yeah. to like just use the function in that lab or something, you know? And it was like so what are you doing something? I'm going to Germany. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm taking classes there. So nice. What's fun? Do you? Uh, tomorrow. Right. Wow. Yeah. And the whole summer or what? Uh, just until July. Oh, nice. So, yeah, at least two months. Yeah. So that'll be like my resume building for the summer, and then I'll just, you know, be able to get relaxing. Are you doing anything? Uh, yeah. I'm looking at Quebec for a couple months, and then I'm doing something for the last summer in the rest of the summer. How did you fuck up these? Uh, I was like, flying. I have a meeting right now, but I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, I was, I was very impressed because I don't think any freshman signed up for anything like that at all. I think she's, she and maybe one other person, or, no, two people are definitely blue stamp, but the other is a sophomore. 